This week, my Democrat colleagues are poised to push through the Senate here, untargeted and unfocused one and nine tenths trillion tax and spending package, and it's all being done under the guise of COVID relief. And some of it is very essential for COVID relief, but a small part of it. This whole act is very unfortunate because it didn't have to be this way. In the past year, Republicans and Democrats were able to work together to pass more than $4 trillion in COVID relief, and it was all done with strong bipartisan support. From the start of this year, my Republican colleagues and I have stood ready to engage in good faith bipartisan negotiations to provide further tax relief. However, despite all the talk of unity and bipartisanship by President Biden, the new Senate majority hasn't even attempted to reach across the aisle. Bart Bipartisanship worked five times over the last 12 months, starting about one year ago right now. The majority, demonstrating their unwillingness to compromise, have resorted to using special budget procedures so that they may pass a partisan bill strictly along party lines. The result is going to be an unwieldy, nearly $2 trillion package that hasn't shaped or isn't shaped according to current economic realities, but strictly by a partisan liberal agenda. In February, the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office, CBO, projected that even without any further stimulus, gross domestic product will return to its pre-pandemic levels by mid-2021. And for the year, the economy will grow at 4.6%. Now, if those two points aren't strong enough, then it, will, it was recently reported that retail sales jumped five and six tenths percent during January. And four, the National Retail Federation is projected retail sales for the year to grow at the fastest rate in two decades. And then if those four points aren't enough, at the same time, personal income is reported to have risen by 10%, and the pers personal savings rate has surged from a historically high 13.4% to over 20%. The American economy will soon be roaring without a $2 trillion further stimulus. It's no longer March of 2020 when the economy was in free fall and businesses and places of employment were shut down. And how were they shut down? By those of us right here in the Congress of the United States, the federal government doing it by government edict. While many individuals in certain sectors of our economy continue to struggle and of course deserve a helping hand Others have largely recovered and are no longer in need of assistance. So, at this time, instead of $2 trillion, two-thirds of it not needed, why not help those hurting and not pour gasoline on the inflationary fires? A COVID relief package should reflect this reality in both size and scope. 
even longtime Democrat economists, such as Obama's former director of national security, Economic Council, have raised concerns about enacting nearly a $2 trillion stimulus package at this point when we're already in recovery. So as former Secretary of Treasury Summers, besides I also referred to him as Director of National Economic Economist, this is what he says, quote, the proposed Biden stimulus is three times as large as the gap between actual and potential output as estimated by the CBO. Enacting a stimulus unmoored from economic reality poses real risks to our economy, including inflation and slower economic growth moving forward. In fact, a Penn Wharton budget model and that analysis of the President's proposed projects, the proposed stimulus would result in a decrease in both GB, GDP and wages in 2022 and over the next two decades. While inflation has been subdued in recent years, we shouldn't let that lull in inflation lull us into a false sense of confidence that we can spend with impunity with no consequences. We are in uncharted waters with debt held by the public exceeding the size of our economy and trillion dollar annual deficits. Moreover, as economist John Greenwood and Steve Hank, professors of economics at John Hopkins recently warned, quote, the money supply will grow by nearly 12% this year. That's twice as fast as its average growth rate from 2000 to 2019. It's a rate that spells trouble, inflation trouble, end of quote. And that is a, without another round of stimulus that we're going to be debating the next few days here on the floor of the United States Senate and probably passing before the end of the week. Concern of inflation has been dismissed by the White House and by the Federal Reserve. This sounds too familiar to those of us who witnessed the stagflation of the 1970s. We were told by President Nixon and his advisors that they could spend their way to lower unemployment and economic growth without inflation. They were wrong. The Nixon administration mistakes ushered in a decade of disastrous inflation. And I've said for decades, if Nixon did something, we ought to learn from it and not repeat it. It was with this background of stagflation that I first ran for Congress on a platform of fighting inflation. Inflation is a regressive stealth tax on every single American. It is particularly unfair to those who have very little money to begin with and those who have lived beneath their incomes to save for the future only to see their hard work wiped out as the value of the dollars that they put away plunges. Hopefully, Nixon inflation is only history, never to retain. But none of us can guarantee that inflation won't return. Not only is the size of this stimulus package detached from reality, so is its scope. 
A common adage for stimulus and economic relief measures is that they should be timely, they should be temporary, and they should be targeted. By this standard, the Democrats' stimulus is well wide of the mark. More than one-third, or about $700 billion of the funding in the bill wouldn't even be spent until 2022 or beyond, according to the CBO. How does anybody know that we need a stimulus in 2022 and beyond? By what standard does the Biden administration say that, that we're going to need that? And isn't that got something to do about the failure of this bill to accomplish what it wants to accomplish, or even the need for it, if some of this money won't be spent until the outer years? I don't know about you, but I don't see how spending hundreds of billions of dollars years from now is either timely or targeted as these economists talk about a stimulus, if it's going to be any good, needs to be timely and targeted. How does it, or what does all this have to do with fighting the pandemic right now, the people hurting right now? Are these same people going to be hurting in these out years when some of this money is going to be spent? If that's the case, this brand new administration is already admitting that their policies of the future are a failure and a failure today. Nearly a quarter of the package, or $422 billion, is dedicated to direct payments to households with incomes up to $200,000, all regardless of whether they have lost a job or experienced any loss of income. Such untargeted payments make little sense. When just this past week it was reported that personal income was up 10 percent, personal savings rates soared to over 20 percent. We clearly shouldn't be using taxpayers' dollars to pad the bank accounts of those with six-figure incomes when we ought to be targeting this towards those who are unemployed and those who are low income. Then we have another $350 billion of this package going to be allocated to bail out fiscally irresponsible states at the expense of states that have managed their state budgets wisely, like my home state of Iowa. This spending is hard to justify, giving recent reports indicating most states saw little to no drop in revenue between 2019 and 2020. And many states that were previously projecting shortfalls are now projecting budget surpluses. The package also includes hundreds of billions of dollars in liberal wish list priorities that have very little to do with the current pandemic. This includes enhancements to refundable tax credits and expansion of Obamacare s subsidies and an $86 billion taxpayer bailout of poorly managed pension plans. And on poorly managed pension plans, that's, uh, that's something that I've been trying to reform over the last two years. And reform is necessary as much as helping them with some taxpayers' dollars. But there's absolutely no reforms in this stimulus of those multi-employer pension plans is simply an $86 billion bailout. In, in the 
the case of COVID, there are some things that no amount of money can address. Until the widespread immunity is achieved, many people will not feel comfortable eating out, going to a movie, taking in a concert, or traveling on a vacation. Spending trillions of dollars will not change the attitude of those people that are going to still be very cautious. So here's what I'd spend the money on, and a lot less money than one and nine-tenths trillion dollars. So yes, let's prioritize funding for vaccine distribution, assistance for the unemployed, and aid for small businesses in the struggling sectors. And by all means, let's open our schools. Doing this doesn't require $2 trillion. Let's remove the pork in this bill. Let's set aside the long-term left-wing wish lists and work together as we did before in those five bipartisan bills over the last 12 months and they have passed both bodies overwhelmingly. Several of my Republican colleagues approached the White House a few weeks ago with a list similar to what I just said, maybe a longer list of items proposed by President Biden that could get Republican support with minimal tweaks. A bipartisan package along those lines could well have passed a few days ago. It's still not too late. I hope we can make a bipartisan effort happen yet. I yield the floor and suggest you, uh, I yield the floor.